Is there any aspiration where in a moment like this, with all of these weird things taking place worldwide, where maybe you've sat down behind closed doors with your family, with somebody, and have said, you know, Dad, Jordan, why, why don't you go in there and see if you can be the leader of a great country like mm-hmm. Canada and do something about it? Has that conversation ever taken place at this phase of your life? Yes. And? Well, I've thought about a political career at different points throughout my whole life, starting, literally, starting when I was 14. In fact, that's what I thought I would do when I was 14. I worked for a political party in Canada. It was a socialist party, as it turns out. And uh, I had that option open to me when I was extremely, when I was very young. But I figured out when I was about 16 that I didn't really know anything. And so I had ideas, and I was capable of functioning in the realm of ideas and putting them forth even then, I would say, in a somewhat compelling manner. But I, I figured out, partly because I had worked with a lot of small business people and also on the board of governors of this little college I went to, these are all people who built businesses from the bottom up. They were all immigrants because everybody in northern Alberta was an immigrant. And they didn't share my left-wing presuppositions, but they were very admirable people. And part of what made them admirable to me wasn't their facility with ideological conceptions. So it wasn't an intellectual attraction. It was a practical attraction. I would worked in restaurants in this little town I grew up in, Fairview. And uh, I liked working with the guys that, that, that built the restaurant. And I talked to them one day about uh, the, the Socialist Party in Canada and Alberta at that time had a pretty good small business platform, probably better than the Conservatives had in terms of what it would do for small businesses. And I asked them one day, why aren't you in favor of this small business platform? Because they wouldn't vote mm. for the NDP, the mm-hmm. Socialist Party, <laughs> to save their lives. They said, well, we don't want to be small business people. <laughs> we want to be big business people. And so I learned then that what a people... What to make. Well, the guy I worked with, his name was Scotty Kyle, and Scotty was a rough guy. He was about 35. I was about 15 at that time. And Scotty had been an alcoholic, and he had, like, all his teeth knocked out in fights. And, like, he was a rough guy, but he was super funny, and he was really smart. And he said to me one day, people don't vote their reality, they vote their dreams. And I mm. thought, hey, man, that's a good phrase. You know, that's stuck in my mind for the rest of my life. And so, so in any case, when I went to college, I went, I was going to, I went to, to, to take political science and literature, and I wanted to go into law school. I wrote the LSAT, and I was set to go to law school. I wanted to take corporate law. And the reason corporate that I law. wanted to do that was to understand my enemy. That was the idea. And who was your enemy at that point? <laughs> well, I was still, the uh, when owner, I went, yeah yeah, 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 the big corporations, yeah, yeah. essentially, big corporations, Powerful. you know. Yeah, wow. Um, but I, I realized about a year into my college education for a variety of reasons that, partly reading George Orwell, but that wasn't all of it, that um, I also didn't like, I, I went to a lot of the uh, NDP party, and it's New Democratic Party, it's not the NDP party, New Democratic Party conventions provincially and nationally and I'm, I had access to the leadership for a variety of reasons and a lot of the leaders were reasonably admirable people or maybe even completely admirable people who had worked with labor unions and like they were really they were advocates for the working class in a real sense mm-hmm. uh, but the party level activists I never liked them from the beginning I thought I don't trust you guys you just seem to be driven by resentment not not genuine care for the working class. And so that that didn't sit well with me. In any case, I started to get interested in psychological motivations for political behavior, especially as I went through my political science degree, because there was increasing emphasis as we moved away from the classics, which is what I studied in the first couple of years, to more modern political thinking, let's say. It was all quasi-Marxist, in that the political scientists believed intrinsically that people were only motivated by economic concerns. And I just never believed that. I thought, that's which economic concerns and why? Well, those questions weren't asked by political scientists. They took economic determinism as a starting point, and that never sat well with me. I thought there was a mystery there because it wasn't obvious to me what motivated people, and we're not ruled by our bellies as far as I'm concerned. So the idea of Pure economic determinism was a non-starter, and that's really when I started to get interested in psychology. And I've made a choice all the way through my life. The choice has always been, say, political, sociological versus psychological, or perhaps spiritual, and I've always 
chosen the psycho psychological work at the level mm -hmm. of the individual. And I don't think I'm going to stop doing that. I mean, I have had discussions, serious discussions with people about a political career. And first of all, in my current situation, it isn't obvious to me at all that that wouldn't be less effective than what I'm already doing. You know, so that I, wouldn't be less it, effective. Yeah, yeah, it'd than be less effective. Yes, it would be less effective for me. to... What do you mean by that? Well, I'm. I mean, well, I know I'm, what you mean by that, but what do you mean by that? I mean, you mean to tell me you would you're you're having the same amount of impact now as you would as the PM? No, I think more. You by would have a lot. more right now. You're, you're having, having more impact. Yeah, yeah. Look, so, those are hard jobs, and it's very and you get boxed in very quickly, and they're also brutal jobs, and it isn't obvious to me that I have the stomach for it. I don't really like fights. In fact, I don't like them at all. Part of the reason that I said what I said back in 2016 when I first stood up and voiced opposition to what the universities were doing and also what my government was doing was because I could see where that was going. I could see that it was going to generate conflict of all sorts. I knew, for example, that all this pronoun foolishness was going to confuse thousands, particularly of young women, because there's a whole... there's an a very large clinical history of that sort of thing happening mm -hmm. for 350 years. So that's detailed in a book called The History of the Unconscious, which is a great book by a man named Henry Ellenberger, who wrote the best book on the history of psychoanalytic thinking. And so I knew that. Um, in any case, part of the reason I spoke up, and this was a hallmark of my clinical practice and also of the manner in which my family was organized, is like, we're going to have that fight right now. And we're going to make peace because I don't want to have this fight every day for the rest of my life. And so it's going to be a pain to fight through it because it's always a pain to fight through a conflict. But if you can fight through it, you can make peace and then you don't have the conflict. And I really don't like conflict. So I don't like it deferred because I know what happens if conflict is deferred. You get weaker because you backed off and the conflict gets more intense because its tentacles grow in a sense. It's like not paying your, not paying a utility bill. It's like for the first month, it's not that big a problem.